change and return uh, the challenge to its caller as a function. So this is the get encryption zero code that we arrived after disassembling the get encryption key function. The first thing we see is how it calls uh, the query system time function with the low part uh, of the return value current time, we'll add a counter and we'll update that counter and we'll create a seed uh, using that formula. We'll only use uh, the low part of the current time and only the middle 16 bits. And we'll uh, add and subtract a number and once the seed is created, we'll call the RTL uh, random function uh, three times in a row. The first time we'll use the created seed and the second and the first time we'll use some kind of feedback that the RTL random function uh, returns also. With uh, the three numbers returned by RTL random function, uh, based on the third one, we'll modify the first and the second number and we'll concatenate the results and return a challenge. That will be the challenge. So we know that uh, the current encryption a key function gets entropy from the current system time and also from the counter. We'll create that seed, we'll call RTL random, and we'll return a challenge. So uh, if, we, if we know the internal state of RTL random function and the current system time and also the value of the encryption key count, we can calculate all the numbers returned by RTL random function and we can predict the challenge to be issued in the future. So I will explain the RTL random function in detail. Well, first, the RTL random function is a PNG, uh, which appears to be a maclaren marsaglia system that I will explain later, uh, which uses uh, two LCGs that I will explain later. So first, we'll create uh, numbers using two LCGs as an m, &M system. We'll fetch a value from an internal vector, the internal vector, uh, it is related to the m, &M system. We'll store a value into that vector and we'll return the previously fetched value from the vector and the context to its caller. So I said that uh, an m, &M system uses two LCGs. LCGs are linear congruent generators. Uh, these functions are good for uh, statistical randomness and for simulation but it's not suitable for cryptographic purposes because it generates a predictable sequence of numbers. Well, m and m, m, &M is the form of the RTL function. Uh, that's the algorithm for creating the sequence of number. It was proposed around 1956, and uh, the authors wanted to improve uh, the randomness in statistical means of uh, the LCGs. In the paper that they are proposing that, they are also proposing using a table of known random numbers because uh, they need the properties of random numbers, but they are not dealing with prediction or predictable sequence in the future. They are dealing with long periods of random numbers. So the basic algorithm is first create two numbers using the LCGs, construct an index to use it uh, in the internal vector, fetch a value that I will call set uh, and store a value, and we'll return the previously fetched value. Well, I have like a little demo of what's happening inside there. We have the vector with uh, n size length, which is initialized. First, we'll call the first LCG, and then the second LCG. Based on the output of the second LCG, we'll create an index to use it uh, to address values in the table. We'll fetch a value at the index created, and we'll store a new value which was created with the first LCG and return the previously fetched value. So again, a zero code of the RTL random in this case that we disassemble. We have all well, the contest that it needs for the LCGs. First, we can see uh, the formula of the LCG. It doesn't matter right now what's happening right there, but that's a formula of an LCG. That's the second LCG, so we have two numbers created. The second number will be returned as a context then an index will be created and that index will be used first to fetch the value and then to store a value and will return the previously fetched value and also the context. So 
we know that RTL random uh, is an MNM system, so we can define two operations. A fetch operation that is dependent on the value of the table and also the seed, and a store, which is only dependent on the seed, but is independent of the values of the table. So we're trying to know uh, what's happening between the different uh, factors. First, what happens with get encryption key count value, if we can predict it, what happens when calling RTL random multiple times, if it changes the internal state of the vector, and also the return value of the uh, query system time. So the encryption key count value is always initialized at zero at system boot time. It is only updated by the get encryption key uh, function, but as Hernan previously said, it is not usually called. So we can predict that the, that counter will be zero if we start an attack. Also, calls to RTL random. Uh, calls to RTL random may change the internal state of the, of the vector, but uh, that's not, not an issue because we can know if that happened, so we, can, we could relaunch the attack again. So the consequences of RTL random uh, can be circumvented. And finally, uh, what will be the time uh, when the get encryption function is called? Well, we know that uh, for the, based on the plot, that that could be the same among consecutive packets, only the middle 16 bits, probably the most volatile part of that value is used. But we also found that the current system time of the server is sent to the attacker during the SMB negotiation. So the current system time uh, can be predicted or known by the attacker. So knowing uh, those factors, we built an attack. We designed an attack in four steps. First, to set that internal vector of the uh, RTL random in the server to a known state, then calculate all the possible challenges that can be generated by that internal state, collect the possible responses, forcing a victim to respond to all those challenges, and then connect and use a valid response because the server will send uh, a pre-calculated challenge. So the first step, the first step, we will request authentication as an attacker to the victim. The victim, once the authentication is requested, will call the get encryption function and will call the RDL random function three times and will update its internal vector. So, and will return a challenge to the attacker and also the timestamp uh, in the packets. So, what the attacker can do is simulate the store behavior of the m, &M and then, well, loop to A until all the simulated vector is complete. In this way, we have a simulated state of the server. So once we have that internal state, we can go to the next step on calculate all the possible challenges that can be generated with that internal state. So the simplest way is to get uh, the combination of all those values, but uh, we can also try to guess which values are going to be issued also, but the simplest way is to uh, combine all the values. Then, how to collect uh, all the responses for those challenges? Well, we could send an email to a victim with, uh, for example, an HTML with image tags, and the victim will, con will connect to the custom SMB server, and the attacker will send all the challenges pre-calculated using that internal vector, and the victim will send back the responses for all those challenges. And then uh, the final step is to connect to the, to the victim and wait for one of those predicted challenges in step two and respond with an informed response, a valid response to the victim and the victim will authenticate the attacker. All right. I know that's like a lot of information, but <laughs> the basic idea is that based on the fact that the server, based on the fact of how the function that is generating the challenges work and the uh, choice of, uh, of the PRNG uh, the function is using, and also because the server is basically 
leaking the seed that is the current system time to the attacker, we can pretty much simulate and uh, do the same calculations that the server does, and we will basically replicate the internal state of the PRNG in our machine. So basically you have a remote machine, and you have, we have our local machine, and we, we are gonna know at any point in time what is the internal state of the PRNG used by NTLM in the remote machine when we want. So basically that can be used to predict all the pseudo random numbers that the server is going to generate. And that allows us to uh, do the prediction attack. The prediction attack is basically saying, hey, I know when you're going to predict this certain challenge, just this one, and I'm gonna tell the client, hey, give me the corresponding response for this uh, nonce or challenge, and I know that uh, I can use that to authenticate against that server or any other server. So basically you are uh, optimizing the attack and reducing the, the number of uh, uh, connections that you need from the client. And it's also, I think, once you have the time to understand everything, it's quite interesting in on itself from a technical standpoint. At least I believe that. So, <laughs> some uh, very quick clarifications that we want to make about the vulnerability is that uh, because of the way that we are actually getting the responses that we need from uh, the big team or the, uh, yeah, the big team in this case, some people think that it is, this is some kind of a SMB relay or SMB credential, uh, credential reflection attack, but it has nothing to do with that. It's actually, I would say, worse than that because the, these flaws are breaking like the rules the protocol has to comply with, that is that the nouns have to have certain properties, so it's, it's kind of fundamental. It's like this is the thing that cannot be failing in this protocol, and it was failing. Uh, and also the patch that was recently published uh, by Microsoft that fixes the one case of uh, SMB relay or SMB credential reflection where you now, after you apply the patch, can exploit the same machine uh, you are doing the attack uh, against, well, this doesn't affect this attack because this is different, a different attack. And in an uh, SMB relay attack, you are making a victim connect to you and then you are relaying the connection. You are keeping the original connection open. In this case, we don't do that. We just connect to the client, disconnect. Make the client connect to us, disconnect. And then we have the dictionary. Once we have the dictionary built, we can use that whenever, whenever we want. So we don't need to maintain uh, a session and this is one of the reasons why this patch does not address this, vulner this, this uh, vulnerability. It also didn't, the patch was, wasn't trying to address this at all, but some people tend to confuse that. That's why we are mentioning it here. And also, like I said, that uh, passive replay attacks are possible. I tried to explain as better as I can all the things about NTLM, SSP, and how it is used by default nowadays, but uh, <coughs> Like I said, depending on the clients you have on your network, passive replay attacks could be possible. And that's, I would say, one of the most interesting attacks because how do you go about detecting that? I don't know, because you have to have some kind of IDS that is, knows what an attacker will look like, will, uh, look like when trying attempting the attack. Remember that the attack is just listening to traffic and then just connecting to a server and doing something that over the wire is the same thing that a valid client would do to get access to a server. So, <clears throat> one thing that we wanted to talk about, the scope, severity, and impact of this vulnerability, is that when uh, Microsoft published the, uh, their advisory for this vulnerability, they called this vulnerability an elevation of privilege vulnerability, and also said that this vulnerability was important. This is something we discussed with Microsoft. We respect their opinion, but we think that is a critical vulnerability, not actually uh, only an important one because I th the protocol is failing badly, in my opinion. And also, it's not an elevation of privilege. I mean, you can execute code, and we're going to show you how. It's not something. It's like it's like a uh, something that you would expect this could be used for. It's not something that we are doing because it's kind of crazy. It's kind of the same thing that SMB really does, or that PS uh, PSXEC from Swiss Internet has been doing for a long time. That is just uh, using DCE RPC over SMB to uh, create a service and execute uh, code that way. We also think, uh, also that we think that the, the importance of the vulnerability is given because is from, I mean, as someone that is looking for bugs all the time and is 